and thank you for joining Contagion. I'm Grant Gallagher, and in today's segment, we'll be sitting down with Dr. Adam Brufsky, a professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, to discuss an emerging theory which, if true, could change our understanding of COVID-19. Dr. Brufsky has recently shared several interesting hypotheses in peer-reviewed journals, among them, that there may be a dynamic where hyperglycemia, and not simply diabetes, increases glycosylation of immunoregulatory proteins and leads to more severe COVID-19 disease. Both the virus and the ACE2 receptor it attaches to require sugar molecules bound to their protein for the binding to take place. Another interesting conclusion would be that there are two strains of the virus with different virulence on each coast of the United States and in some of the European countries that have been hardest hit. And where it gets both optimistic and controversial, the virus may be attenuating over time. To explore these and other ideas, let's get started. Thanks for joining Contagion, Dr. Brufsky. You're a longtime friend of our colleagues over at Onc Live, but this is your first time joining us with Contagion for an infectious disease audience. So I just wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself and um, give us a bit about your background before the pandemic and how you got involved here. Sure. I mean, it's kind of unusual. I usually do all the Onc Lives. That's how I know MJH and all of your publications. And, you know, just for introduction, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I run the Breast Cancer Center there. I'm a medical oncologist. And, you know, why a medical oncologist would be interested in an infectious disease question is a very interesting one. Uh, to be honest with you, what happened with us is that we've known about hydroxychloroquine for a long time. That's really kind of got me interested in this. We've been using it to clear breast cancer cells out of the bone marrow. There are clinical trials uh, of hydroxychloroquine currently ongoing at Penn. We've had some other ones that were in the past. And it was really interesting, you know, when this whole thing about hydroxychloroquine broke probably about seven or eight weeks ago, it got me really interested in the topic. And for that reason, here I am. And just to kind of start things off, uh, we were very interested in hydroxychloroquine for a variety of reasons. But it seems to kind of affect what's called tumor dormancy. And what that means is that when breast cancer cells escape, one of the places they go to is the bone marrow. And they sit there for many, many years just to re suddenly regrow. We have no idea why that happens. And there's a theory as to why hydroxychloroquine could do it. And it kind of got me interested in it. And additionally, we knew that hydroxychloroquine is an oral hypoglycemic agent. Uh, it's been used many places. The problem is you can't use it for a long time because it causes retinopathy. And so, I mean, it does cause acute T issues, but they're fairly mild. But on the other hand, it causes retinopathy. And so, you know, you can't really use it in India, actually. Some Indian colleagues of mine turned me on to this, that it's actually used there. You know, when metformin was on patent, uh, they were using hydroxychloroquine instead. And there's some literature from, uh, at least from the um, rheumatology and from literature, uh, that women who have rheumatologic conditions have been on hydroxychloroquine for a long time, actually have lower hemoglobin A1Cs. And so there's simply clearly something going on with it out and above what we think it does. And I was talking to an infectious disease physician actually from Livingston, New Jersey. Uh, he's from St. Barnabas. And, you know, he kind of told me, he said, Adam, you know, he said, I'm, I'm got all these patients in the ICU and not only do they have diabetes, you know, but they have prediabetes and there are even some with unexplained hyperglycemia. And we kind of talked to, we kind of like kind of looked at each other and said, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe it's not the diabetes it's the hyperglycemia per se. And so it was the combination of this understanding of that, that hydroxychloroquine is a hypoglycemic agent on the one hand, and on the other hand, seeing these severe COVID patients in ICUs coming in with a lot of diabetes and a lot of unexplained hyperglycemia got us thinking. You look at the, you look at the literature of mice, and you know, clearly the first thing we know is that the, the, the virus binds, at least in some way, to ACE2, the ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor in the lung and other places, actually. And we realize that. And so then you start going around and looking at all these animal models you know, of hyperglycemia and of diabetes and see if ACE2 was even involved in it. And the beauty is you've got the internet. You could search it. You could find this really quickly. That's what we didn't have in the past. We didn't have the internet where a doc can kind of make a really interesting clinical observation or his colleagues could. I mean, go back and say, wow, we can go look this up. So what happened was, we go back and we find these mice, they're called NOD, which is, I think, non-obese diabetic. And it's a, an outbred strain, or it's an inbred strain of mice uh, that's been maintained for many, many years. 
And when you go look at the mice, you look at their lungs. When the mice are diabetic, when you don't give them insulin, they apparently had high levels of ACE2 in the lung, as well as, interestingly enough, in the pancreas. And when you gave the, the, gave the animals diabetes, the level of ACE2 went down. But really, when you started thinking about it and really looked carefully at the experiments, it wasn't really that the ACE2 went down in the diabetic lung. It's that the amount of glycosylated ACE2 went down because the antibodies that they were using found a glycosylated antigen. And in fact, the actual ACE2 activity in the animals didn't change with insulin administration, but in fact, it actually the amount of glycosylated ACE2 changed with the insulin administration. So that got me thinking and we kind of went back and forth and you know, finally, you know, I came up with this hypothesis um, based on a lot of what people knew about the SARS literature in monkeys. They had a monkey experiment where they took animals uh, and actually gave them SARS. They gave them actually the SARS virus. Uh, and then they saw they, they collected their convalescent sera. Then they took another set of monkeys. And what they did is that they gave them a vaccine against SARS. They were trying out SARS vaccines at the time. They vaccinated the monkeys and then saw what happened to them. And it turned out some of the monkeys got sick from the SARS vaccine, which you expect. I mean, when you're trying to make a vaccine, as, as, as your infectious disease guys could tell me, I'm a medical oncologist, but you know when you develop vaccines, a certain amount of people are getting sick from it, and the monkeys were getting sick. So anyway, so you have the SARS-like virus in monkeys, and what happened was when they infected the monkey, they vaccinate the monkeys, and they infect them, and a certain amount gets sick. And when you take the monkey and you give it, they got, when you gave them the convalescent sera before they got too sick, even at a low dose, so even at a high dose, enough to clear the virus, a certain amount of monkeys got really sick and a few of them died. And what they found was that the sera was inducing a really brisk kind of auto, a really brisk immune response. In other words, we know something, I think a lot of your viewers probably know something called macrophage polarization. And it turned out that the macrophages were being polarized from kind of a resting kind of M2 kind of wound healing state to like an M1 state, the cytokine storm and all these other things. And so they found with some very elegant experiments, it was done in, a, there's a paper in JCI Insight, it's about a year or two old, I think from 2018, 2019, where they did this and they actually looked at it and they found that it was the sera, it was the IgG of the sera that was being made that kind of somehow interacted with the um, FC gamma receptor on the macrophage to drive this conversion. And so this all led me to this kind of this idea that maybe it's the amount of glycosylated protein, glycosylated spike, because of glycosylation, you know, things like diabetes not only affect glycation, where they actually add a sugar, there's a chemical reaction as a sugar to protein, but actually glycosylation, the enzymatic processes in cells that in response to kind of certain metabolic uh, inputs can actually either increase or decrease glycosylation of proteins. And the feeling was that maybe there's something about diabetes that increases the glycosylation of the receptor, the glycosylation of the spike, and maybe even the glycosylation of the immune proteins that somehow were involved in it. And that, you know, you could see that something was happening around day eight or, you know, seven, eight, you know, in patients not only with SARS, but with SARS-CoV-2, with COVID-19, something was happening to them uh, and it was really kind of related to the immune response. I think we all know this already. I think everybody over the last couple of months or, you know, has really realized this. But on the other hand, uh, it was really interesting. And, uh, you know, you kind of know this because you see that, at least in SARS, the degree of production of the neutralizing antibody was kind of correlated to the amount of symptoms you had. And so in SARS-CoV-2, there's a few studies, studies out there, again, the issue in this field is a lot of stuff is done by preprint. It's not peer reviewed. It's hard to know what's going to really withstand the test of time. But again, we're trying to do everything we can, all of us, even a medical oncologist like me, to try to figure this out. And so that led now to the next kind of series of questions. So I kind of put this out there. I published it in the Journal of Medical Virology, probably the middle of April, maybe middle or early April, something like that. And so then the next question really in front of us was, well, if there's glycosylation, you know, and that seems to be an issue, maybe there are mutations in the viral coat that maybe can increase or decrease glycosylation and therefore increase or decrease virulence. And we knew this, if you go back and look at the SARS literature, again, I think I'm using the SARS literature as a way to understand SARS-CoV-2. When you go back and look at it, there's all these really interesting experiments where they don't really use the SARS itself. They do these pseudotype vectors. In other words, I think your ID guys probably know what those are. You know, and I didn't really know a lot about them, but I kind of learned quite a bit about these pseudotype vectors. And what they do is you make like a lentivirus or some other virus, and on top of it, you put like a spike protein piece of it. So you have like a virus that's not infective, but it kind of looks like the spike protein. 
And so when they did these experiments with the pseudotype vectors in cell culture, what they found is that it's not only, if there were specific sites, it's all published, it's all out there. It's actually referenced in one of my papers. Um, what they found is that there was specific asparagine, because again, it's an asparagine and uh, asparagine and amino acid, whatever you want, then ST. We call these can canonical NXST sites, where they predict for glycosylation of the asparagine. And what they found is that there were certain specific sites in SARS-CoV-2, in SARS-CoV in this, in this, in this pseudotype lentivirus, where if you've deleted them, you wouldn't get as much entry of the entry of the cells into uh, into the into the uh, what you call it into the into the cell culture into the inside of the cells. You couldn't you, you lost infectivity. In fact, when you treated the, the lentiviral pseudotypes with endo H, which removed all of the glycosylation, um, it wouldn't even enter at all. And it was really interesting though. It was not the specific site, but actually the number of sites. So the more you had glycosylation, the higher probability of infectivity there was. And we kind of and I'll talk at the end kind of why we think this. But on the other hand, that's kind of what was happening with SARS. So they went back and looked at all of the, at least the ones they had, and they saw over time that there was progressive mutation from like the civet, where it came from, to like the most severe version that you had progressive glycosylation of the viral spike based on the, based, basically on the, mutate, the number of glycosylated sites. In other words, you'd have an amino acid and it would change to an asparagine and be in one of these NXT canonical sites. And so they said, wow, this is kind of interesting. You know, maybe it's really the glycosylation that was part of the jump, not only the, not only the ACE2 part of it. In other words, we know, or we've learned at least, that the way these things jump from bats to, to intermediate hosts to humans is through progressive mutation of the uh, receptor binding domain of ACE2. But in fact, there was something even more going on that had something, had something to do with glycosylation of the viral spike.